see for yourself what is truth and what is fiction. This is exactly how the town of Fatima, Portugal reacted when they were told by three children that they were given visions by God that would predict the future and that God would prove himself by making the sun itself dance in the sky. This event began in 1916 in Portugal when three children, Lucia and her cousins Jacinta and Francisco, were asked to help the family by shepherding the sheep that day on the family farm. The family were devout Catholics and well-liked within the community. The children never caused any grief and were known for being very well-behaved. So, the parents saw no reason for the children to always be unaccompanied in their work, despite that all of the children were ages 10 and under. Now one day, as the kids were playing in the meadow while moving the sheep, Lucia saw a bright light glowing like a crystal hovering above the ground. As the children inspected this mysterious apparition further, the sparkling light began to shape and morph into a beautiful human-like creature with wings. This being claimed to be the angel of peace and asked the children if they wanted to pray with him. The children thought it was an odd request after seeing a ball of light manifest into a person, but being children, they happily accommodated the request. The angel later told the children he was preparing them to witness the Virgin Mary when she would come to visit. The kids didn't understand and asked why they were going to see Mary, and the angel responded that Mary had very important information that she specifically wanted to share with them. The angel expressed that humanity needed to know what was going to come in the near future, and people, pure and unselfish of heart, such as innocent children, should be the ones to share this knowledge with the world. The angel then disappeared in front of their eyes after promising he would come back. The children began to become excited and they would get to meet Mother Mary, and it would be an honor to bring them and their families. The children raced home and told their parents, aunts, and uncles everything. The adults in the family were dismissive and, like most adults in that situation, just assumed the children had an imaginary friend or that they were playing a game of pretend. The children were told no matter what they saw, they still had chores to do and no imaginary friend was going to change that. The kids were disappointed and no one believed them at first, but they were more preoccupied by the excitement of seeing the pretty, sparkling man again who was so nice to them. For weeks, the children waited and no sign of the man had come. It was coming to a point where even the children were starting to believe that maybe they had imagined the whole thing. It wasn't until weeks later that the same angel appeared again to the children. So the children raced down the meadow and enthusiastically greeted this supernatural stranger, beyond happy that their odd encounter was not imaginary. The angel settled the children down and told them that the world was at a lot of unease and pain and it would only get worse if humanity did not change and repent and become kinder. At this time in 1916, the world was currently engulfed in World War I, the Great War, where advancements in technology meant that man was coming up with more ways to kill and cause destruction. The angel referenced this to the children and said they needed to pray and prepare, because if man didn't change, something much worse was coming. The children asked why the angel was so invested in spreading this warning, and the angel responded that he was the guardian angel of Portugal, and it was his duty to try and stop any more pain as best he could. That's why he was relying on the children to spread the news. He claimed he couldn't appear and speak to just anyone. After leaving them, the children once again sprinted back home, told their family everything that had happened. This time, the parents were beginning to get concerned. It's one thing for a child to mention offhandedly that they saw a pretty light that talked to them. It's a whole other when you have three kids giving a very specific and articulate message about the dangers of international warfare. Clearly, somebody was telling these small children to repeat this. The parents got together and discussed if maybe there was another shepherd on the property who was talking to the kids, but after the uncle went with the kids several times after this incident and saw no one, the family concluded that maybe, just maybe, it was an odd event. Maybe the children had heard it from somewhere. So months go by, and by the time autumn finally rolls around, the angel appeared a third and final time. This time, the angel had a golden chalice in his hands. The chalice was filled with blood, and the angel had the host, 
a wafer used in Christian services to represent the body of Christ in his other hand. He knelt in front of the chalice and taught the children a prayer of reparation, a prayer of forgiveness to the children before he offered them to the host. He told the children that the Virgin Mary was coming, and with big news, and the children needed to spread the word that man had to repent and humble themselves and stop causing all the pain in this world before something worse comes. Once again, the children mentioned the angelic apparition to the family members without much coming from it. Although, because the children had been speaking about these visions for so long now, the parents had mentioned it to the other villagers to see what they could possibly make of it. Word began quietly spreading around the town about this odd happening, but not much coming from it. All of that would change by 1917. It was then that the children finally saw the apparition of the Virgin Mary. The children were asked to herd the sheep near the Cave of Peace, also known as the Cova di Aria. They saw a massive flash of lightning crack across the sky, and the children covered their eyes as something bright was swelling over the cavern. Like the angel, the light sparkled like a sun rising over an ocean, and the children opened their eyes to see what they would describe as the most beautiful woman they had ever seen. Dressed in white and golden robes, the woman told the children to not be afraid of her and that she was a friend from heaven. For six months, she came to the children every 13th of the month at the same time. Mary asked the children if they would be willing to suffer in order to do the right thing and bring hope and peace to the world. Lucia was the first to speak up that day, and they were ready. Lucia then claimed that light shot out of the palms of her own hands, and all three children were rendered unconscious for only a few moments. When they woke up, Mary was gone. As gossip was now ripping through the town about the amazing claims these kids had, people in the village asked if they could attend some of the meetings with Mary to see for themselves if she was really there. The children agreed, and the next meeting, over 50 villagers attended the rendezvous. Now, this is the point in the story where you would expect Mary to not turn up at all, with the children making a million excuses as to why she didn't appear. But what makes this story a noteworthy tale in history is that Mary allegedly did show up, and 50 adults in the village claimed to not only see her, but hear her actually speak to Lucia. When Mary appeared before the villagers, she asked Lucia to pray the rosary every day to pray for the souls of the lost. She also told Lucia that it was important for her to learn how to read as illiteracy, especially among young girls, was very common at this time. Mary had told her that her cousins Francisco and Jacinta were going to go to heaven very soon. But Lucia would live much longer and needed to devote herself to spreading the word of peace. Lucia asked Mary if this meant she would live her life completely alone without her cousins by her side. Reportedly, Mary smiled at Lucia and told her that no one is ever really alone. Once again, light shot out of Lucia's hands, but this time, an image of a heart wrapped with thorns was inside the light. Lucia understood this as a metaphor for the love in the world being poisoned with hate. The next month, the town was reeling over the 50 witness accounts from adults in the village who claimed to have witnessed the entire thing. And now word was spreading like a wildfire. And the children went off on their own the next meeting as Mary had promised them visions that only the children could see. As Mary appeared again, the children claimed that Mary cracked open the earth's crust using light that radiated out of her hands beneath the earth's surface. The children said they saw the bowels of hell itself and the demons within. The children were understandably horrified by their first vision that hell was supposed to be real. Mary warned the children that she showed them this vision to help them understand that if humanity didn't devote themselves to living more righteous lives, more people will be sacrificed and a war much worse than the Great War was just on the horizon. Strangely, Mary had requested the children to make specific prayers on Saturday to try to bring Russia back to God, saying horrible things were going to happen to Russia in just a few years if their leaders don't devote themselves to piety and compassion. The third vision was that an angel wielding a flaming sword above as a man in white robes below climbed a mountain top blessing with the souls of the dead. When he reaches the top, a human soldier had killed him with bows and guns and watched him perish. 
Lucia was told to keep these visions a secret for a short time. As the children went back home, they weren't quite themselves for a few days as they were still reeling from the shock of what they had experienced and seen. The mayor of Fatima requested that the children be brought to him as he didn't like the attention the children and subsequently the town were getting. The children were kidnapped by the mayor's employees and even when threatened with death, the children never changed a single detail about their stories. When the children were released, they saw Mary a few more times and she told the children October 13th will be the day of the miracle. Now, tens of thousands of people came to see the cove to see the apparition of Mary and this alleged miracle. Everyone from skeptics to religious figures and fanatics made pilgrimage to this place with pious believers, even coming barefoot and praying the rosary as they walked. In 1917, in front of tens of thousands of people in Fatima, Portugal, all witnesses claimed they saw the Virgin Mary appear to them. Mary told Lucia that the Great War was going to end very soon, but she was still concerned about how man was behaving. If they did not stop their wickedness, a worse war was on the way. Lucia asked if Mary could cure sickness and trouble from the people in the crowd as many had requested. Mary said that although she was happy to intervene with some mortal problems, Many people's troubles could be fixed by the individual's labor themselves. She encouraged everyone to not only pray for themselves, but pray for people who are dying that have no one to pray for them. Before she left, Mary asked Lucia to make sure a church was built where she was, as this was a special place and people needed to pray more. Mary then held up her hands towards the sun and a flash erupted as she disappeared. The sun began to zigzag and dart across the sky, and people were screaming in horror as the sun then looked like it was going to fall on the earth, making people think it was the end of days. But the sun didn't land on the crowd, but instead, it zoomed upward and went back into place, leaving behind a stunned and horrified crowd. After a few moments, people in the crowd began to notice that disabilities and sickness had vanished. The lame could walk, the blind could see. People in the crowd began rejoicing and weeping at this otherworldly supernatural occurrence. Hundreds fell to their knees and praised thanks between sobs of joy. After the miracle, it was discovered only the people of Fatima could see the sun dance, but the sun moving was seen by over 20 miles away from the site as well. Shortly afterward, Francisco and Jacinta fell ill from the Spanish influenza epidemic that had now swept over the entire world. And just as Mary had warned, both children would perish young and leave Lucia behind. And sure enough, Francisco and Jacinta died from a fever shortly afterward. A priest suggested that it would be better for Lucia if she left Fatima, where she was treated as both a celebrity and met with fear from other townsfolk. She was, after all, still a child. Her parents agreed and Lucia learned to read and study with Carmelite nuns, getting her education that Mary had requested. She ended up becoming a nun herself. Lucia claimed to still see visions of Mary and speak with her through the years. In 2005, Lucia died at the ripe old age of 97. All three children are recognized as saints in the Catholic Church and hold the title of the youngest non-martyred saints in the entire church. What makes this story extraordinary is just how many witnesses there were to this claim. In a lot of similar tales, the deity or miracle doesn't occur in front of witnesses for one reason or another, but on multiple occasions. Thousands of people witnessed exactly what they were promised. Even today, there are photographs proving that such a pilgrimage did in fact take place on that fateful day in 1917. For most of us, our childhood unfolds in neighborhoods surrounded by other children. Some of these settings are rural, others urban. Either way, most of us had had friends with whom we could make our own adventures. Rarely did actual adventure encroach into our lives. This was not the case, though, for Dana, who grew up along the Pearl River deep in the heart of Louisiana's Honey Island Swamp, one of America's most pristine wetlands. Her family home was isolated from civilization in a way few of us can really comprehend. She had spent her youth in and on the water where it seemed anything could happen. The Southern Gothic Tableau of St. Tammany 
Parish provided a backdrop for Dana's adolescence. Massive cypress trees stretching over the bayou. Spanish moss clinging to their limbs like curtains obscuring manifold mysteries. In this setting, Dana was in constant contact with the diverse flora and fauna of the swamp. It became almost routine to have run-ins with bears, alligators, and raccoons. According to Dana's grandfather, Harlan Ford, something far more sinister prowled the 70,000 acres of swampland. When she was just 10 years old, Harlan told his granddaughter, I don't rightly care what anyone else thinks. I know what I saw, and you better be careful where you go back out there. That's no joke, kiddo. Harlan Ford was referring to a series of events that began in 1963. Harlan, who had retired from his career as an air traffic controller, spent his remaining years as an avid hunter and amateur aviator. This skill allowed him to scout the most remote reaches of Honey Island Swamp, those hidden hunting grounds which enticed him the most. That summer, Harlan spotted the perfect campsite from the air. It was where the west and east branches of the Pearl River met, a treacherous region where few other hunters dare to tread. If they can manage to establish a foothold there, he and his friend, Billy D. Mills Sr., would find little interference from competing hunters. They'd have the run of the place. Using the heading obtained while flying, Harlan and Bill began the arduous task of bushwhacking through the swamp and navigating around the countless lakes and bayous standing in their way. They soon discovered that if they docked their boats as two strategic points, the majority of the path to the hunting ground would be accessible on foot. After establishing their route, the two hunters began moving supplies out to the campsite between the rivers in early August of 1963. And that was when they first encountered the Honey Island Swamp Monster. Harlan and Bill were hustling through the forest that day, hauling a heavy outboard motor to their destination as quickly as possible. When they rounded a bend and noticed the hind quarters of an animal standing on four legs in the trail, it was about 20 yards ahead of them, busying itself in the bushes. At first, they thought it was a wild hog, but as they watched, they realized it was different. As seasoned outdoorsmen, they knew all the animals native to the swamp, but the pair could not figure out just what was blocking their path. What the hell is that thing? Bill had asked. As the sound of his voice, the shaggy shape whirled about to face the men. It was covered with short, dingy gray fur with longer hair on its head that almost reached the ground. Its bottom half was thin and lean, while its upper half, including the chest and shoulders, were massive. Atop this frame sat a square, human-like head, which glared at the pair of intruders. The creature shifted from all fours to stand upright on two legs, stretching over seven feet tall. From the looks of it, it had to weigh at least 400 pounds. This massive figure then bolted from the trail over a mound of earth and into the briars and bushes, leaving Bill and Harland absolutely stunned. The men dropped their gear and tried to flank the creature, readying their rifles for a shot. But the opportunity never materialized. It was as if they had seen a ghost. A subsequent search of the area failed to reveal any tracks or den. This was the first of dozens of encounters that Harlan would claim. From that point forward, he and his friends would catch fleeting glimpses of the Honey Island Swamp Monster or hear its cries echoing across the bayou. These occurred most often at dusk or in the dead of night and seemed confined to a relatively small area of the swamp. Seasoned hunting dogs, never afraid to corner a black bear, would return to their owners whining frantically, tails tucked between their legs. Some sightings would be accompanied by a suffocating stench. While it often seemed to avoid people, there was always the sense that the creature could be highly dangerous if provoked, or if it felt it had any advantage. Mostly, though, the Honey Island Swamp Monster just seemed curious. 
Harlan related the encounter of one friend who, while gathering firewood on a camping trip, glanced up to find a tall, dark, immense form on two legs watching him nearby. It bobbed its head from side to side as it stared, and the friend grabbed his gun but could not bring himself to fire at the thing. It simply looked too much like a human being. Instead, he shouted at the apparition, which melted and melded into the darkness of the forest. Anyone with a passing interest in the subject is well acquainted with the so-called celebrities of cryptozoology. You have Bigfoot, the wild man who prowls the forest of North America, and its cousin, the Yeti, which howls from the top of the highest peaks of the Himalayas. You also have Nessie, the infamous monster which allegedly lurks beneath the waves of the Scotland's Loch Ness. Anyone with a deeper interest in cryptids might even know about Mothman, the winged monstrosity that has harassed Point Pleasant, West Virginia, starting in 66, or the half-human, half-canine known as Dogman that strikes abject terror into the hearts of witnesses. But far fewer folks realize that an even more bizarre human-animal hybrid has a long history of sightings all around the world. Yes, cat people, a nightmarish merger of a human and feline anatomy. Like Dogman, these beasts are unprecedented in the fossil record, but nonetheless appear throughout eyewitness reports time and time again. In many of these stories, cat people seem to arise out of nowhere, only return back to wherever they came, never to be seen again in the area, raising the question of whether we were dealing with a physical creature or something far more sinister of the metaphysical. In July of 1964, two campers near California's Mount Tamalpais in Marin County found themselves essentially held captive in their tent. The culprits seemed to be a pair of creatures they had observed shortly before setting up camp. Both witnesses described the beings as half cat, half human. They stood around five feet tall, weighing at least 200 pounds, but lacked any noticeable tails. As in many Bigfoot descriptions, the witnesses said that their heads sat close to their shoulders, almost neckless, atop their muscular chests. It wasn't until later in the day that they heard the two creatures calling back and forth to each other in a fashion described as chittering. The campers stayed in their tent, refusing to do so much as peek outside until the noises had stopped. Now, four years later, a similar monster was seen through a window in the rural outskirts of Lorraine, Ohio, on November 9th. Around 5.45 in the morning, a married couple by the name of Cat Aldo awoke after something large smacked the roof of their home. When the sound shifted towards the window, they discovered two massive paws sitting on the windowsill, an enormous inhuman face peering inside. The thing it most closely resembled was a 600 pound lion, yet its coat was a dusky grayish brown, slightly lighter towards its front. Mr. Cat Aldo immediately leapt from his bed to fetch his shotgun and return to the bedroom. The cat person was gone, and Cat Aldo briefly stormed out of the house, barely able to catch the shape of something running on two legs around the home's east side. It swayed side to side with an ape-like gait, and the witness later estimated the cat person had stood around six feet tall. As evidence corroborating their experience, the Cat Aldos were able to produce a pair of handprints from the windowsill. Curiously, these appeared human and, in a bizarre detail, seemed to be reversed. Paranormal researcher and author Barton Nunnally noted that this same hand orientation appeared during a September 1973 cat person sighting in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. As in Ohio, the hands were reversed, or more accurately, placed backward. It was only around a year later in 1969 when another cat person appeared in Niles, Michigan. A man driving down alone an isolated road saw something approaching the shoulder and slowed down for a closer look. If at first he thought it was a person or a deer, all doubt was removed after the animal charged his automobile. It was a bipedal cat person and seemed enraged at having been spotted. 
The beast shattered the car windows in four separate places with its oversized clawed fist before the driver was able to make a hasty retreat. The creature issued a horrifying squeal as it shrank in the rearview mirror. This spate of cat person sightings in the Midwest continued into 1970. In April, another motorist by the name of Mike Busby of Cairo, Illinois, was traveling Route 3 towards Olive Branch to pick up his wife when he experienced some car trouble about a mile before reaching his destination. The roadway, which at this location ran parallel to the Shawnee National Forest, was dark and deserted. But in the era before cellular phones, Mike had no choice but to diagnose the problem himself. Mike pops the hood of his car to begin scrutinizing the engine. Before he had even a chance to see what was wrong, he hears a noise to his left. A dark figure form, standing six feet tall, rushed him and struck him in the face, knocking him to the blacktop. Now, whatever it was, the figure had Mike pinned to the ground and began slashing at his clothing with razor-sharp claws. And as the two struggled and tumbled, he manages to get his hands near the creature's muzzle, holding its sharp teeth at arm's length to prevent it from seizing his own throat. The stakes were so high that Mike's description of his attacker reads more like a series of impressions than a detailed portrayal. He remembered feeling woolly hair around the creature's mouth, a sharp contrast to the short, wiry hair that covered the rest of its body. The coat almost felt like steel wool. Mike later said that the thing kept letting out these deep, soft growls. Those sounds were unlike anything that I have ever heard. He was able to keep the beast at bay until a passing diesel truck rolled up to the scene, its loud motor and bright headlights apparently frightening the creature away. It darts into the forest, affording Mike one final view of his would-be killer. He later told investigators that the creature was a sleek, shiny black color and it ran away with a heavy, thudding feet. The driver of the truck was able to be a bit more specific. He described it as a giant cat that fled on two legs. Mike was rushed to town where he received medical treatment for his wounds. Cat people can be found around the world because in 1972, a maintenance worker at a car factory near Cordoba, Argentina, had a brush with the unknown that he would never forget. The witness was Teodoro Merlo, aged 56. He had taken a break from making his rounds to visit the factory's washroom, but found that the space was already occupied. Allegedly, an eight-foot-tall creature was casually perched atop a wash bin, gazing at him with a pair of striking feline eyes. The entity appeared to be some sort of cross between a human and a cat, covered in pale fur. Its face bore brown markings on the cheeks, a high forehead, pointed ears, and a distinctly feline triangular nose. Most peculiarly, it was clad in a form-fitting dark blue one-piece uniform that extended to its wrists. The creature apparently vanished, but the sighting left Merlo with lingering ailments in the form of back pain and a pounding headache. That evening on the ride home, he saw the cat person yet again in the rearview mirror of the bus he was riding, but it vanished just as it had earlier. It would be easy to dismiss his sighting as a hallucination or a hoax, but this is not the last time that witness at the factory would report this strange feline presence. Enrique Moreno was delivering documents to the site on his motorcycle when he happened upon what he described as a sort of rainbow very near the ground. Within moments of spotting this apparition, he noticed a shockingly tall, thin presence in the pathway ahead. It looks in his direction, revealing what he said were eyes like yellow light bulbs, ears that rose above the skull in point, a square chin, and a slit-like mouth. As in Merlot's sighting, the being was decked out in a one-piece garment, although this time it shone a luminescent turquoise. Immediately, Moreno's body began itching all over and an incessant drone filled his ears. At this point, he either slipped into a trance state, or, as he claimed, his motorcycle started driving itself. 
Either way, he found himself back at his office, suffering from after effects much as Merlo had. Headaches, burning eyes, and other ailments whose source was difficult to pinpoint. In 1975, everything changed for the residents of the town of Mocha in Puerto Rico. A local newspaper came out with a report that had shocked townspeople, stating that there had been strange animal deaths popping up throughout the month of February. In the neighborhood of Barrio Rocha, three goats, 15 cows, and a pig, and two geese were all found deceased within a span of a month. They were all completely drained of their blood and had strange marks on their bodies similar to stab wounds. A woman named Maria claimed she believed the mocha vampire to be bird-like in appearance. She had seen a large dark bird only a few days prior, sitting on her roof and screaming. Maria describing the bird as being four to five feet in height. However, she only saw it for a moment as it left flying into the skies and left more questions than answers. Well, later in March, the second witness came forward about his run-in with this creature. Luis Torres and his family had sighted strange lights, such as those from a police car in the sky. He believed it to be a UFO sighting and believed this had something to do with the Mocha vampire. He realized the object had been flying on top of the area where the animals had been found dead which caused him to believe that the animals had been killed by aliens. Later, it came out that the same rancher found two large snakes about six feet in length trying to attack one of his cows on his farm. He shot both of them, but left more discussion to the town. Were the strange killings simply due to large snakes? Although snakes can take out large animals, they don't generally drink blood, and there's no way they can leave scratches on the skin of animals. This fact was later confirmed by Dr. Juan Rivero, who was a herpetologist in the area that had studied reptiles. He stated that the only large snake in the area was the Puerto Rican boa, which is a non-poisonous snake. Although large, it is incapable of killing large animals, like a goat or a cow. He also stated that snakes do not have the ability to drink blood as their mouths are not adapted to that. Soon after this report, 34 chickens were also killed and drained of blood. In just two weeks, the death count from the mocha vampire had reached 90 animal victims. Farmers began to worry, and even skeptics would try to maintain their animals at night and within small makeshift sheds to try to shield them from the infamous mocha vampire creature. On March 18th and 19th, more slaughtering had occurred. This time, the victim was a goat and 17 other animals. All of the animals were killed with deep wounds and all had lost a tremendous amount of blood. Surpassing 100 victims now, the mocha vampire had been acting fast. Some people believe that more than one creature was at fault due to the large number of deaths. At the total end of the month, a pig was also found with a large hole in the top of its head and all of its blood drained. It looked as if something had been forced through the skull of the animal with extreme force. One of the pig's ears was also missing, which was unusual, especially due to its clean cut akin to that of a trained medical professional. It wasn't until after the pig's death that another citizen came forward with a sighting of the mocha vampire. This sighting was more akin to the one that Maria had just seen a couple of weeks prior. The man's name was Juan Muniz, and he stated that he had been attacked as he walked through his neighborhood at night. That creature that attacked him was a huge bird-like animal with red eyes and sticky black feathers all over its body. It flew down from above and landed on top of him, trying to pin him down. The man fought for his life and was able to get the winged creature off of him in time to run down to the street to hide in some bushes. He then ran to his neighbor's house once he was safe and later went to the police station and alerted the authorities. However, the authorities still didn't completely believe the man's story. In April, more attacks were reported. 
and over 50 more animals were slaughtered, and more and more people began to report strange sightings of a bird-like creature or even attacks similar to the one that Juan had suffered. On April 5th, a farmer and his men were sitting up at night, waiting to try to catch a glimpse of the strange creature themselves. They left poison on the ground to hopefully kill whatever had been killing their rabbits, but nothing happened during their watch. However, when the men woke up, more rabbits turned up dead. The farmers then created a union, and several farms started to have all-night watches. A nearby goat farm decided to do the same. Now, four men sat outside overnight, watching and waiting. And suddenly, from all the trees and fields around them, the men heard a deafening screaming sound, similar to what the woman who had first viewed the creature had heard on her roof. They covered their ears and tried to block out the sound, and one of the men then saw a large figure running through the trees away from the animals. After inspecting the scene, they had found four goats dead with virtually no evidence of what had happened. The man who had led the watch party stated, whatever killed my goats was definitely not human. I don't believe in vampires, of course, but I can't really say what kind of creature killed these animals. Several other UFO sightings soon came to light. In the Santa Rosa and Cerro Gordo areas, a giant object with rectangular lights was seen hovering around 1,500 feet above a ranch for roughly 45 minutes. There were several witnesses. The next day, upon inspection, scorch marks were actually found on the grass where the object had supposedly landed. Police continued to try to cover up the facts and the stories being shared. They even went as far as a public service announcement to try to silence the public, stating that most of the stories were just that, stories meant to scare them. However, despite the police's efforts to silence the public, the attacks persisted and multiple witnesses had seen these wounds on the animals and the terrifying pale skin of their lifeless bodies drained and void of blood. There was no denying that something strange was happening. These attacks continued into the months of May and June, and hundreds of animals had now died from being attacked by what everyone suspected was the Mocha Vampire. And still, nobody had any idea why or by who. On May 13th, another sighting was reported. A man in the nearby town of Corozal claimed he had seen a large hairy creature with big red eyes. It had growled at him with a sound similar to a small dog. Right after the sightings, three roosters, a rabbit, and five goats had all turned up dead and were drained of their blood as well. UFO reports in May also skyrocketed. Two star-like ships were also reported in the town of Fajarado. Another unknown flying object with yellow lights, similar to previous sightings, was also seen. On May 17th, a few people witnessed a large glowing ball of light coming from the sky. They noticed a huge spaceship-like vessel almost the size of a house. Some viewers also claimed to have seen a dark object with red lights on it hovering beneath the ship. In June, 25 animals in the town of Isabella were killed. A week later, 14 roosters were also found dead. However, in June of 1975, the attacks suddenly ceased. Many of the townspeople of Mocha believed that the creature had flown on to greener pastures, or perhaps somebody had killed it. Whatever happened, the townsfolk were relieved to no longer have to worry about their livestock. Similar to sightings of the Chupacabra, which means goat sucker in Spanish, the Mocha Vampire ravaged communities and drained many animals of blood. All those sightings of the Chupacabra continued after 1975. The sightings of the Mocha Vampire and the mass killings had come to a complete halt. And there have been no further sightings all the way into today. Most of the reports of the Mocha Vampire have been written in Spanish, and there are not many studies done on this in English. For that reason, 
it's a good idea to do your own research when looking at this specific legend. Since video footage was not exactly common in 1975 when this occurred, we only have the eyewitness testimonies of what occurred during these few months. So what do you think? Why did the Mocha Vampire only show up for a few months and then mysteriously disappear? What was the creature? Was it an alien of some kind or a bird-like cryptid creature? Or was it simply a pack of vicious snakes or dogs? Or a legend made up to scare farmers into behaving? Although the sightings of the Mocha Vampire and the strange animal killings in the area had stopped after June of 1975, UFO sightings did not. Many UFO enthusiasts and cryptozoologists believe that the killings were related to the UFO sightings and that the creature, whatever it was, had moved on to other areas of the world. Returning to North America, a British Columbian logging crew endured persistent oddities around their work site in 1973. Hooting sounds, something like they had never heard before, would fill the woods as they felled trees. This, of course, is a common behavior attributed to Bigfoot, and British Columbia is certainly Bigfoot territory. But whatever was prowling their camp was no Bigfoot. Maybe it was Pussyfoot, judging from the prints left behind. Paw prints, like those that would be left behind by a gigantic cat, were found in the fresh mud each day. Perhaps some speculated a mountain lion was stalking them. Well, Eventually, the foreman, a gentleman by the name of Woods, heard the hooting calls while walking in Cedar Swamp area. They were so close that he fled, terrified, back to his Caterpillar truck. And from that day forward, he refused to appear at work unless he had a pistol at his hip. Woods eventually saw the creature responsible for the calls and footprints. He was driving the Caterpillar when he heard a loud noise coming up from behind. Looking nervously over his shoulder, Wood saw what he initially took to be a mountain lion. However, unlike a mountain lion, the creature gracefully landed not on four legs, but on two, stretching lazily as if it had just awoken from a cat nap, and then leapt across a skid and into the trees on the other side, leaving Woods with the impression that whatever it was, it had been half feline, half primate. These sightings eventually caught the attention of a renowned Bigfoot hunter, Rene DeHinden, who visited the site. DeHinden spent 10 days scrutinizing the area for anything unusual. While a sighting of the cat person eluded him, he supposedly did discover the nesting site of some large animal as well as three different kinds of tooth markings on trees in the area. In November of 1980, Multiple witnesses in Maryland reported a cat person which frequented a lover's lane dubbed the Cat Man. The creature earned a fearsome reputation for its habit of peering in through the car windows of amorous young couples. Every witness agreed upon the exact same thing. It was a large, hairy monster covered in black fur, sporting long claws. Its eyes were unmistakably feline, and it had the ability to move around on two or four legs of its choosing. Note, how Bigfoot are often spotted doing the same thing, lurking about lovers' lanes and dropping to all fours when it suits them, begging the question of whether these two phenomena are related. In the winter of 1963, Harland and fellow duck hunters were shuffling through the underbrush and fallen leaves when they stumbled across a wild hog carcass by the lake. It looked as if it had been there for several days. The animal was roughly about 60 feet from the shoreline, its throat torn, and its body covered in deep gouges. Just a short distance later, they found a second hog body, identically maimed. Though bewildered, the hunters refused to let this spoil their day, and Harlan continued his search for ducks. Now, 50 yards further along the lake, he noticed water rippling in the shade of a massive oak tree. The hunters, hoping it was a duck feeding on fallen acorns, approached the area on their hands and knees. It wasn't a duck. It was a third hog. And although it did display the same injuries, it was still barely clinging to life. It lay there on the shore, its hind legs kicking the water as it bled out, 
and a 10-foot radius of blood splatter coated the surrounding vegetation, it telltale signs of a recent struggle. Harlan later reflected on this experience, wondering what kind of creature would do just this for the pleasure of killing, leaving its prey lying in the woods. He and the other hunters left as quickly as they could. The entire affair cast an experience from the prior autumn in a new terrifying light. Harlan and Bill had been out squirrel hunting when they heard something that sounded like beating a drum. At the same time, they could hear a hog squealing for dear life. Both men thought that it had to be something big beating on that hog like that. On another occasion, Harlan and six friends, including Bill, had set off in two boats to fish the West Pearl River. When they tried to return home, however, Bill's engine started to run hot, forcing Harlan to shuffle their party back up the river in pairs, dropping them off at camp. On his first return trip downstream, Harlan's headlamp revealed the creature standing brazenly in the swift flowing river. The amount of snags and debris in the water kept forcing Harlan to look away, but each time he looked back, the creature was where he had left it. He wanted to take a shot, but that seemed like a bad idea. Given the distance, the darkness, and the treacherous water, Harlan reached the stranded fisherman and told them what he had seen. One of them, a skeptic by the name of Jim Hartzog, yelled, Let me have that gun of yours and I'll go back up there and shoot that big booger for you boys. Harlan obliged, tossing him a flashlight, his 870 Magnum, and three shells. Jim went off on his crusade while Harlan ferried the remaining men to camp. Then they had barely started upstream when all the men heard a deep howl and the sound of the firearm discharging twice in the forest. They looked to the riverbank where they saw Jim waving and shouting frantically. They rescued him right away. Harlan was eventually featured on the 1970s television program In Search Of, hosted by Leonard Nimoy. On the program, he shared what he learned from Jim. One evening, late just about dusk to dark, a friend of mine encountered eyes. They were a yellow or amberish color and real white apart, so Jim took a gun, went into the area to try and take out whatever it was, and he says that he came face to face with this thing. It looked something like an ape, about seven foot tall, and he fired on it while using a headlight. He said when he did, the eyes went out. Harlan felt there was nothing supernatural to this, rather that the creature had simply turned and fled. He added that Jim shot at it one more time. We went back the next day and checked for any blood, but we didn't find anything. So we figured Jim missed it that night. Now the next spring, Harlan's son-in-law and another friend had gone out turkey hunting near the lake where they had found the hogs massacred. According to Harlan, around sundown, the two men heard a wild turkey fly up to roost for the night. Instead of trying to bag it in the darkness, they decided to return to their lakeside camp, planning instead to come back to their turkey roost just before dawn. The entire trip back, however, they could hear heavy footfalls following them. Eventually, something inhuman called out from across the lake. The turkey was lucky. Both hunters abandoned their plan, instead moving their efforts to the safety of the opposite riverbank the following morning. One of the best stories of the why Comico Catman comes from autumn of 1980. Four youths were parked near a landfill along the river when a pair of ominous, glowing eyes appeared in the window. The driver sped away, and once they had escaped, the witnesses gathered their courage and several friends to return to the site. Now, two cars strong, the group of friends parked in the area, using their headlights to brighten the area as much as possible. Nothing happened for over an hour, until, from out of the darkness, a lithe bipedal figure stepped into the light from out of the trees. It was clearly not a person. Instead, it was a mixture of human and feline characteristics. Black fur, luminescent yellow eyes, fiendishly long claws, and to top it all off, a long cat's tail. It took several steps before dropping to all fours, lunging at the cars. 
And according to the story, it successfully damaged the vehicles, slashing and punching with enough force to leave gouges in the paint, dents in the body, and paw prints on the windows. Suffice to say, the youths once more tore out of the area as quickly as they could, their escape accompanied by the beast's high-pitched wails. Authorities mounted a half-hearted search of the area, but to no avail, there was really no documentation. No further evidence was ever found, so the case was blown off and you probably can't find much about it. Now, rumors persisted that the Catman was seen by others. Visitors to the river had allegedly found deer carcasses along its banks in the weeks afterward, maimed as if by a large unknown predator. The following month, on December 7th, 1980, a brother and sister just minding their own business near Short Mountain in Warren County, Tennessee, saw something absolutely uncanny. They were relaxing on the back patio shortly before dusk when something appeared in the distance across the partially wooded field. At first, it seemed to be a person, but after studying it for a few seconds, they realized something was wrong. It stood on two feet, but was covered head to toe in light gray hair. Once it reached the pond, only around 100 yards away, the siblings could see that its head resembled that of a cat. The two witnesses watched, mouths agape, as the creature bent towards the pond and began lapping up the water. And as it drank, it revealed a set of long canines, maybe four to five inches long. Then, without so much as a glance in their direction, the figure stood, shambled off in the direction that it had come from, and the entire affair lasted between two and three minutes. Skipping ahead nearly two decades, we find the account of Ray Jones, a woodcarver whose retirement in central Kansas was interrupted by a terrifying attack in 1998. Jones had decided to spend his final years not only sculpting, but tending to a small farm, complete with livestock. According to author Brad Steiger, Jones was working late in his woodcarving studio one night in June when he heard commotion outside. It sounded as though something had spooked all the animals on his property simultaneously. Elsie and Etzer, his two Guernsey cows, were vocally agitated. His dog, an Airedale Terrier by the name of Buster, sat upright and began to growl. At the same time, the geese down along the banks of the pond broke into a cacophony of trumpets and squawks. This last aspect alarmed Jones the most because, in his words, there are no watchdogs as good as geese because they are so dang territorial. Jones cautiously set aside his woodworking tools and opened the door, stepping into the summer night, and a full moon hung in the sky above, affording excellent visibility to the surrounding farmland. At that moment, Jones's chickens added their voices to the chorus of animal cries, in his mind, the hen house must be under attack by some sort of animal, likely as not a stray cat or dog. Jones snatched up a stick and stomped towards the hen house entrance, shouting threats as loudly as he could and waving his makeshift weapon to frighten away any potential predators. He reaches the front door of the hen house, immediately realizing that he would need more than a stick for what awaited him inside. He later described the site to Brad Steiger, claiming that, although it was almost completely dark in the hen house, I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck when I saw something dark stand up and growl back at me. I'm about 5'11", and it was as tall as I am. Then it charged me, knocking me flat before placing its paws on my chest and looking down at me. I nearly had a heart attack when I found myself staring into the open jaws and pointed fangs of a black panther. I could feel and smell its fetid breath on my face as he sat on my chest, sizing me up for a meal. From out of nowhere, Buster came to Jones's aid, rushing into view to incessantly bark at the intruder. Despite being pinned down by the beast, Jones was now more worried for his dog's safety than his own. He could fend off the creature for a little while, but poor Buster wouldn't be able to withstand more than a casual swipe from one of those monstrous paws. Without any reason, maybe Buster succeeded in scaring it away. The attacker simply rolled off Jones, and instead of landing on four feet, 
it rose up to stand on its hind legs as if it were the most natural thing in the world. The creature then turned, dropped to a quadruped stance, and fled off into the Kansas night. Jones rushed inside and dialed the sheriff's office, not only to report the incident, but to alert authorities that a large, unknown predator was roaming the community and is deemed incredibly dangerous. Of course, Jones was assured that he must have been mistaken. There are simply no Black Panthers anywhere in Kansas. I mean, come on, and a bipedal one? Law enforcement eventually dispatched a deputy to the scene, but he dismissed Jones' experience outright telling him that he had simply encountered, I don't know, maybe a large, feisty tomcat. Jones was adamant, though, that he had not only been a black panther, but that the creature was as comfortable on two legs as it was on four. For lack of a better term, he had faced down a cat person. Concluding his story, Jones stated that, fortunately, there were no other reports of such a creature in the area and I guess he just jumped back into whatever nightmare he jumped out of. In 1975, UFO researcher and journalist John Keel wrote a book called The Eighth Tower. In it, he made observations about several paranormal events that had occurred in the Caribbean in the 1970s. He claimed that these aliens and creatures that were often viewed alongside UFO sightings were resistant to human weapons. For example, in other cases in the U.S. where strange cryptids or creatures had been sighted, such as the infamous Skinwalker, high-power rifles often didn't have any effect on the animal. It often takes longer than normal to kill one, even if you get the chance. He believes that radiation and the unique structure of these creatures' alien composition are the reason for this, as well as the reason why some of these creatures like the Mocha Vampire, are only here on our planet for a little while and then disappear into nothingness. He states that these animals may also have lethal or harmful amounts of trace radiation on their bodies, which can make people very sick. His theory was confirmed in the 90s when investigators following the trail of a chupacabra in 1995 found dangerously high radiation levels in the areas where the chupacabra had supposedly attacked. Although the mocha vampire seemed to cease to exist in Puerto Rico around 1975, similar stories and sightings of creatures that had the same appearance and behavior as the vampire were seen in other areas and have continued to be seen until today. Even before the 70s, some reports were made. In the 1960s, for example, a study was released by Interstellar Communications by Philip Morrison and Giuseppe Conconi. They aimed to seek out alien life by using microwaves. In 1961, a conference called the Search of Extraterrestrial Intelligence was held. The goal was to find as many intelligent alien creatures as possible in hopes of striking up communication. One researcher from the conference, Frank Drake, chose to work in Puerto Rico on his search for alien life. The researcher himself had created a radio telescope, which he used to try to sight creatures in the forest of Puerto Rico. In the mid-1960s, a guard sitting post at the telescope witnessed something very odd. The man reported seeing a strange man or figure walking around the area of the telescope's vision. The man or creature was reportedly wearing a long black cloak. The guard believed he was seeing a vampire or some sort of undead creature. He thought nothing of it at first, but later on received word from someone nearby about a disturbing occurrence that had happened that same night. Drake reports this. I was forced to look into it because a cow was found dead on a nearby farm with all the blood drained from its body. The vampire rumor had already spread through the observatory staff, and now the cow incident whipped the fears of many into a frenzy. This case shows that animals being drained of blood was not a first for the area, and it is possible that the creature was roaming the deep forest of Puerto Rico long before its debut in the cities and farms of the area in 1975. 
Of course, in the 1990s, the Chupacabra got its name to fame when it was first sighted in 95. Although not exactly bird-like in appearance as the mocha vampire was said to be, it often killed farm animals, draining their blood partially or completely. It was most well known for sucking the blood of goats, which is where its name comes from. Although the sightings of the creature differ, those who have seen it said it has a reptile or alien-like appearance. Many believe that it is associated with UFO sightings in the area as well. It has even been sighted as far as northern Mexico and the southern United States as well to this day. In 1995, eight sheep were discovered dead in Puerto Rico. They all had three puncture wounds in their chest and were completely drained of blood. Although these killings were similar to the Mocha Vampire's killings, eyewitnesses claimed that they were two different creatures altogether. In August of 95, over 150 farm animals and pets were said to have perished by the hands of this creature. A woman by the name of Madeline Tolentino said she had seen the creature and that it appeared to be a large reptilian creature with the body of a furry alien. Soon, reports of farm animal deaths similar to the ones in Puerto Rico started popping up in places like Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, and many other countries. Even India had similar attacks where animals had been found drained of blood. Forensic experts and police officers, once again, claimed these killings were simply due to the attacks of stray and street dogs. However, nobody was convinced. As far as they were concerned, street dogs did not drain animals of blood or leave severe puncture wounds on their bodies. However, not everyone believes that these sightings or reports of the chupacabra were real. In fact, a study was done on some of the animals that were said to have been killed by the creature, and a veterinarian in Puerto Rico named Dr. David Morales analyzed 300 animals and stated that not one of them had been bled dry, although some blood was missing. In the U.S., many of the chupacabra sightings were said to have just been a rabid coyote or dogs with a terrifying mangy appearance. In fact, a biologist in the United States stated that he believed all of the chupacabra reports to just be coyotes infected with a parasite known as Sarcoptes scabi. He said this disease would leave the dogs with little fur, thick skin, and a foul odor. He said coyotes often attack goats because they are easier prey, especially when sick. However, the doctor is unable to confirm all of these sightings as the chupacabra is said to make its killings far away from humans or in the middle of the night when farmers aren't expecting it. The sightings of the chupacabra are different depending on the area, which leads some cryptozoologists to believe that they are not the same creature at all. Perhaps they are from a breed of similar creatures or aliens, akin to the mocha vampire. One such sighting is of a reptilian creature that is said to hop around, similarly to a kangaroo. Other reports state the creature looks like a wild dog or a wolf with a pronounced spine, dark eye sockets, large fangs, and big claws. Both creatures are said to drain the blood of their prey, and both are also said to create three holes in the shape of a triangle when they kill. However, one or two holes have also been sighted. Similarly to the Mocha Vampire, both the reptilian and dog-like versions of the Chupacabra kill at night, away from human eyes, or quickly before they can be spotted. Both have been sighted, and both tend to have large amounts of radiation left on their prey, Interestingly enough, similar types of attacks have been carried out on livestock in the U.S. in recent years. Although there have been no sightings of what did it just yet, in the state of Utah from the 1990s to the current year, similar events have taken place at a ranch called Skinwalker Ranch. You might have heard of it. At the ranch, UFO sightings have been reported often as well as sightings of a grizzly wolf or dog creatures that tried to attack cattle. In the past, cattle have mysteriously died and some have been completely drained of their blood, such as the animals in the cases of the Mocha Vampire and Chupacabra. 
Although some of these cattle were brutally ravaged and mutilated, some were left intact with no entry wounds and missing all of their blood. In photos released by the original ranch owners, you can see cows that have been completely destroyed by whatever attacked them. Their bones and organs are dry, and it appears that there is no blood in or around them. In fact, the owners of the ranch state that there is not even a drop of blood on the grass around the animal. In the case of the Skinwalker Ranch, many of these killings have happened in 2018 and onwards, although the majority have happened beforehand. And this leads cryptozoologists and extraterrestrial experts to believe that whatever is behind these killings is an animal that is still at large and has not gone away. Other sightings on the ranch include strange pillars of light that come down from the sky and illuminate the fields and ridges of Skinwalker Basin and reflections of light that show up on the mountain at night. One rancher even found a wolf trying to kill his cattle, which were within their nighttime enclosure, where they could not escape. He claims it took over seven shots for the creature to desist and that it did not seem to be harmed by the gun very easily. In the area, there is a high level of microwave radiation and UV rays. When measured, these amounts are extremely dangerous for humans, especially higher up in the sky. At night and in pure daylight, lights have been seen in the sky which seem to stay in one spot and then mysteriously disappear. Harlan's son, Perry, and his wife were camping in Honey Island Swamp when they too heard a hideous cry echoing across the lake. At first, Perry simply gripped his gun and told his wife it was nothing to worry about. When the sounds got too close for comfort, however, he began building a fire as quickly as he could. No sooner had the flames roared to life than the creature began circling the camp. From just beyond the fire's protective glow, they could hear it snarling, crying, even breathing. It came so close. And Perry was born and bred in the swamp, and he had never heard anything like it in all of his years. Eventually, the sound stopped, and Harlan Ford made his first cast of the Honey Island Swamp Monster tracks in October of 1974. A detour had led him to a new portion of the area that he had never visited, and within the maze of bayous, he discovered a trackway leading to a watering hole. Luckily, Harlan now more or less an amateur cryptozoologist at this point, had plaster of Paris on hand and had the foresight to go work. After they had set, what they revealed was remarkable. Some of the footprints were over 10 inches long, smaller than most Bigfoot tracks, while the heels and arches were recognizable as those of a primate, the feet ended in toes and claws, which seemed almost reptilian. What's more is there were only four toes, connected by some sort of webbing. Suffice to say, this contrasted starkly with the human-like prints cast around the same time frame in the Pacific Northwest. Whatever haunted Honey Island Swamp wasn't quite Bigfoot. It was different. Harlan Ford continued to gather evidence supporting the Honey Island Swamp Monster's existence until his very death in 1980. After he passed away, his wife Yvonne discovered a treasure trove of evidence in a box in his attic. Plaster cast, a formal letter explaining his experiences, and a now infamous grainy 8mm film. It was nested alongside other reels with labels like turkey, deer, or even gator. This one read Honey Island Swamp Monster. The film shows Harlan traveling upriver by boat, before climbing a tree to film from a blind. As the camera surveys the forest edge, a figure comes into focus. Large and walking on two legs, apparently covered in fur as it stalks to the swamp, and then disappears into the trees. Despite his appearance on television, Harlan was actually quite private about his experiences with the monster, mostly sharing them among family and friends. If he had fabricated the entire thing for fame or for hunting rights, why had he sat upon such compelling evidence? Harlan wasn't a man to make up something like that, Dana Hollyfield said years after his death. 
He was down to earth and honest and told it the way it was and didn't care if people believed him or not. Dana thinks that her grandfather never released the film for two reasons. Number one, he had seen the ridicule people heaped upon him for his sightings. And two, he may have feared for the safety of others. Someone trying to be brave and to kill the monster might injure themselves or another human being in the process. Or, should their shot miss, the being might attack them. The stories and evidence that her grandfather produced left a lasting impact on Dana. To this day, she has written more on the Honey Island Swamp Monster than anyone else. A self-proclaimed swamptologist and monsterologist who regularly releases books not only on the creature, but the beloved bayou in which she was raised. It would be easy to dismiss the Honey Island Swamp Monster as one of these fictions passed down within a family. However, people outside of Harlan Ford's bloodline have found themselves facing down large, hairy creatures in the swamp as well. While Harlan Ford may have logged the first official sighting of the Honey Island Swamp Monster, Stories had circulated throughout the region for years. Dana Hollyfield has collected dozens of such encounters. One of the more famous witnesses was trapper and fisherman Ted Williams, who was also featured alongside Harlan on In Search Of. And he told filmmakers that, First time I ever saw it, it was standing plumb still like a stump. I stopped and realized it wasn't a stump and it wasn't supposed to be there. When I stopped, it ran. It was dark gray. About seven foot high, it jumped a bayou, and that was the first time I saw it. The next time I seen him was swimming in the river, the Pearl River. Two of them, one was bigger than the other and faster than the other, and they swam just like humans with them long overhead strokes. I tried to get one of them to look at me, and the other one ran off, and the other one would not look at me. I could have shot it, but I wouldn't on account it wouldn't look at me. It looked too much like a human to me. Broad shoulders, arms hanging down below the knees, hands looking almost like a human. Ted would claim numerous sightings of the creature over his lifetime, often as they crossed the river. On one occasion, he claimed his boat was so close that he felt water hit him as the creatures shook their coats dry. It's worth noting that Ted first mistook the Honey Island Swamp Monster for a stump. This is reported time and time again in Bigfoot sightings. Apparently, the creatures can stand so still that they are often misidentified as stumps, not only in blurry photographs, but in eyewitness accounts as well. Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner discuss numerous examples of this behavior in their two-part book series, Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomenon. Returning to Ted... A few years after his television debut, he disappeared into the swamp. The only thing recovered was his boat. In recent years, this claim has come under doubt, but is no less mysterious. Ted's granddaughter told Dana that she thinks they did find his body, but she didn't know how he had perished. This is not the first death or disappearance associated with the creature, because in 2017, the descendant of a Pearl River resident wrote Dana Hollyfield, telling her that his great-grandfather once found the monster sleeping in a den in an isolated corner of the swamp. Deciding he should kill the beast, he came home to fetch more ammunition before returning back to its lair. He was never seen again. When the great-grandson revealed the victim's name, Dana recognized it immediately. Rumors had circulated all throughout the swamp for generations about the man's mysterious disappearance. Accounts like the one told by Ted Williams suggest a breeding population of creatures rather than a sole long-lived specimen. Now, this possibility was corroborated by Fred Lemon, who saw several of the monsters while at his buddy's camp with a girlfriend. Lemon said the location was in the farthest reaches of the swamp. A heavy rain had just set in. Without warning, a hairy fist shot through the glass window of their camper. I looked out the window and could see a bunch of them roaming around there in the rain, Fred had told Dana. So I threw open the door and fired my shotgun at them and they scattered. A sleepless night ensued. 
Fred and the woman left at first light, swearing off Honey Island Swamp entirely. Cat people sightings were sporadic through the early years of the 21st century. In 2000, reports emerged from Wisconsin, Vermont, and Springdale Cemetery in Illinois, where several witnesses claimed to spot a massive, powerfully built, cat-like creature darting between the grave monuments. In 2005, a witness residing near the Sierra Nevada mountains in Sonora, California, claimed to have been hanging her laundry out to dry when she saw a peculiar figure lurking about her yard. She had taken a brief break to check on her children's safety, but when she peered around the garage, she saw what she described as a small head, exactly like the shape of a cat, and a humanoid body looking back at her. It stood around 5'7", with orange, white, and black tabby cat markings. Like the Argentinian cat person seen in 72, it wore a dark, form-fitting jumpsuit underneath which the witness could clearly see breasts. Both parties froze. The cat person looked surprised, her ears perking up, and her green almond-shaped eyes widening. She then retreated back around the garage. At the same time, the witness received several impressions regarding the creature's age and intent, leaving her convinced that the being meant her family no harm. For this reason, she failed to further investigate until several hours later. Predictably, the cat person was nowhere to be found. Now, thousands of miles away, another cat person appeared to a 17-year-old Mohammed Azmi in Kedah, Malaysia. He was sleeping in his home when in the wee hours of the morning on September 21st, 2006, the sound of footsteps awoke him. Asmi listened intently as a guttural voice began speaking in a strange language from somewhere over his head. Somehow, the creature dropped from the ceiling and directly into his bedroom. Facing him was a creature he described as black and hairless with the face of a cat. The boy instinctively lunged at the intruder, which bound from the bedroom. He gave pursuit, fighting the creature in the living room. It appeared confused as it frantically searched for an exit. As the young man watched, the creature grew more agitated until, seeking a solution, Asmi rushed to the front door and opened it. The cat person immediately hopped past him, disappearing into the darkness beyond the doorway. Perhaps most recently, Indiana witnesses on a church retreat in late September of 2009 spotted a six-foot-tall cat person. It was evening, and the primary witness, an adult, was playing hide-and-seek with the children around their camping shelter. Shortly after the game began, they stumbled upon a bipedal figure running towards the woods, cutting through the tall grass of a field at the rear of the building. The children were the first to spot the figure. They said that it ran to the tree line with its arms held by its sides before abruptly stopping just short of the forest. Believing this was an adult waiting to be found, the children approached the form, only to have it drop to its belly in the tall grass. The shape shot towards the witness with an almost serpentine grace. The children froze in terror. Luckily, the creature altered course, diverting to another set of trees. When it reached its destination, the thing began climbing the tree trunk until it was out of sight. All present, 15 witnesses in total, described the monster as a deformed cat-like animal. Simultaneously, another child shouted, I see him! When the others looked, however, the kid was pointing at a second figure running in a different direction. A brief pursuit of this new intruder ended when it was lost in the woods. Now, what could these creatures be? Scattered throughout the world's mythologies, we find a few suggestions. Cat therianthropes, humanoids with feline attributes, appear throughout the iconography of ancient Egypt, a culture which revered cats. The most famous examples are the cat or lion-headed goddess named Bast or Bastet and the iconic Sphinx, immortalized in the stone of Giza. Researcher Barton Nunnally mentioned earlier sees early descriptions of the Greek manticore as a possible precedent for modern cat people. Common depictions of the manticore show the hellish combination of a lion's body, a human's face, and in a departure from contemporary sightings, a scorpion's tail. The manticore appears analogous to the Persian Mardkora, which enjoyed feasting upon human blood. 
In indigenous traditions, we find creatures like the Kinnigur. Native Australians believe that this creature sports human limbs, but the body and head of a qual, a marsupial predator related to the Tasmanian devil, which appears vaguely cat-like. Supposedly, tribes in the modern-day Maryland, where the Wicomico Catman appeared in the 1980s, once spoke of a creature similar, which guarded its hunting territory with terrifying ferocity. Cat people may also represent a modern expression of age-old beliefs surrounding gadanthropy. Similar to the UFO sightings in the Puerto Rican town in 1975, in 2019 in the Sylvie's Valley Ranch in eastern Oregon, Another similar story took place. Five of the ranch's bulls suddenly showed up dead, drained of blood, with body parts removed in a surgical fashion, similar to the pig that was killed by the mocha vampire in Puerto Rico that was missing an ear. The ranch's vice president, Colby Marshall, states this, We got out and took a little walk to where one of the bulls was found, and the carcass was still there. He then goes on to explain the animals are purebred bulls worth around $6,000 each. He says this, I mean, this is the frontier. If some person or persons has the ability to take down a 2,000 pound range bull, you know it's not inconceivable that they wouldn't have had a lot of problems dealing with a 180 pound cowboy. Many people believe this is the work of aliens and several UFO experts have come forward stating that they believe aliens have taken the cows in the night, drained them of their blood, and released them back onto the property without a single sound. The animals were not shot and there were no wounds, apart from the surgical precision cuts that were made on their missing body parts. In 2017, 200 miles south of the area, another cow was found cut up in the same way and also missing its blood, showing that it was not a one-time thing in Oregon. Although the ranchers tried to look for some clues around the body, there was not even a footprint or any tracks. There had not been any rain or snow, and the lack of clues as to what had happened left the ranch owners concerned. This case has still not been solved, and the Harney County Sheriff's Office in Oregon offers a 25 grand reward for anyone that has information that could help or potentially solve the case of the mysterious dead cows. Utah and Oregon are not the only states that have witnessed these strange killings. In fact, in 1975, the same exact year as the Mocha Vampire, Nearly 200 cases of cattle mutilation similar to these were reported in Colorado alone, showing that these types of killings were not unique to Puerto Rico. In the Colorado killings, part of the cows were removed, such as an udder or eyes or sex organs or tongues. They were removed with a sharp instrument and had clean cuts. However, investigators and authorities have never been able to find out who or what was responsible. Although some believe that these killings are made by satanic cults, others believe that they are done by creatures such as the chupacabra, mocha vampire, or aliens themselves. While we are all familiar with legends surrounding lycanthropy, the act of becoming a werewolf, many ancient magic traditions held that human beings with the proper training in black magic could become just about any animal they pleased. Medicine men and women, witches, warlocks, sorcerers, and black magic practitioners, as well as shamans practicing in regions where big cats were more common, often transformed into these predators rather than wolves. This is especially common in South America, where shamans might turn into jaguars, or in Southeast Asia, where leopards predominate. A perfect example is the Burmese headhunters of the Myanmar. The Naga also took the heads of tigers and leopards. Some used these totems to become werecats. In fact, one Naga headhunter told Westerners that my soul does not live in my body. It lives in the leopard. It is not in me now. It visits me in sleep. I meet it in my dreams. If anything happened to my leopard in the day, my soul would come and tell me. I would get the same wounds. Could cat people be a manifestation of similar practices? While human-cat hybrids appear only sporadically in world mythology, 
cats in general enjoy a long-standing association with the supernatural. Few animals have as many superstitions built around them as cats, who seem to skirt the boundary between our waking world and unseen realities. The close association between cats and witches, for example, can still be seen in Halloween decorations to this day, expressing older beliefs that small animals like cats might serve as witches' familiars or spirit helpers. To these traditions, we can also add modern sightings of large black cats, which appear in areas where no such animals should exist. Reports of such specimens in North America are especially bewildering. While jaguars can be melanistic or entirely black, this coloration is rare, and the range of jaguars rarely extends beyond the lower regions of the southwestern United States. While the U.S. and Canada do have populations of mountain lions to date, there has never been a confirmed case of one with melanism. Simply put, large black cats, or as cryptozoologists have dubbed them, alien big cats, or ABCs, should not be seen north of Mexico. Yet, wildlife officials are regularly flooded with reports of ABCs, even in places like Ireland, the British Isles, Western Europe, and Australia where there are no comparable big cat species, and certainly none that should be black. To make matters more mysterious, these large cats often exhibit near-human intelligence, disappear at will, and sometimes leave no footprints behind where they clearly should. They also appear in conjunction with a host of other strange happenings, including Bigfoot reports, fairy folklore, UFO sightings, possessions, and hauntings. In fact, a case could be made that, after anomalous lights, ABCs are the most common phenomena accompanying paranormal activity. For example, during a Minerva, Ohio's 1978 Bigfoot sightings, the large, hairy creature was sometimes joined by a pair of large, strange felines. These were witnessed not only by the townspeople, but also by investigator Barbara Galloway, who said that the cats looked mutated, their height and color like a mountain lion's, only with their heads misshapen. Some old North American logging folklore used the term wampus, interchangeably for ABCs and Bigfoot. In reports from the Big Thicket area of Texas, Bigfoot are as common as ghost lights and ABCs, woods, and a black panther which left footprints on their property. Now, these associations continue to this very day. While ABCs are not always explicitly connected to UFOs, the presence of two anomalies in the same area at the same time certainly implies a link. Could cat people come from another planet? A handful of accounts do seem to suggest this possibility. Such stories often sit at the more bizarre end of the UFO logical spectrum. Cases involving cat people and flying saucers stretch back to at least the mid-20th century. Neil Benson, who runs Pearl River Echo Tours today, remains adamant that he too saw something strange in Honey Island Swamp during his younger days. I was 16 years old, paddling away from duck blind in a piro, he said. I saw something tall, moving unlike any creature I have ever seen move on two legs through the water unimpeded. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't like any man I've seen. To this day, he is at a loss for what it was. Tours like the one Neil Benson operates are commonplace in Honey Island Swamp. Visitors are often afforded a glimpse of the wetland's untouched beauty, including the abundance of wildlife found within. Although rare, visitors sometimes see more than they bargain for on these excursions. A woman named Terry had contacted Dana Hollyfield in the fall of 2010. Terry explained how she and her stepson and her father took a swamp tour on November 9th, just three days prior. As she surveyed the shoreline from the tour boat, Terry spotted something horrendous. It was a figure, gazing back at her from the trees with enormous sickly eyes. The eyes were tinted yellow as if diseased and set within a face whose skin looked old, worn leather. The head sat up top a seven-foot-tall body covered in grayish-black hair. The sight left Terry absolutely petrified. She did not speak a word to any of the tourists, 
No one, including her stepson and father, seemed to have seen the thing. Although several other people did mention a foul, filthy smell which made them gag. Something the tour guide dismissed as an animal carcass somewhere hidden along the riverbank. She concluded her message to Danon by saying, What was supposed to be a very relaxing afternoon with my family turned into the most terrifying day of my life. Honey Island Swamp resident Denty Crawford knows this fear all too well. He was driving his three-wheeler one day when he spotted a large animal running up a levee. Initially, believing it was a bear, Denty stopped his vehicle, grabs his rifle, and set off in pursuit. As he drew nearer, he began hearing the sound of lips smacking. Eventually, Denty spotted it through a break in the foliage, a creature with man-like shoulders covered with hair. But its back was more flat than rounded like a bear, he said. The thing was enjoying a meal of bugs pulled from beneath the bark of a nearby tree trunk. Denty slowly backed away, unsure whether or not a single shot could take down something so massive. He refused to go back to that part of the swamp again. Time and time again, we hear witnesses vowing to never return to the site of their encounters. Such was the case for Jerry Ross, who reluctantly shared his story with Dana Hollyfield. After his camper's generator died unexpectedly, Jerry looked out the window to see what was the matter. Looking back at him was a seven-foot-tall silhouette covered in dark hair and sporting a pair of red eyes. Jerry backed away from the window. He grabbed an extension cord to tie the camper door shut. At last, he dared to look back outside. The red eyes were now closer than ever, peering in on him. I shot a flare out the window, he said, and the next thing I know, it's up in the trees looking down with red eyes. It didn't try to hurt me, but it stayed there most of the night. When daylight came, I left and I did not go back up to my camp for two years. In 1981, a friend named Hubert told journalist Jerry Bro that he encountered the monster one warm morning while hunting. He was perched in an oak tree looking for deer when heavy footfalls began approaching from behind. Hubert froze as an eight-foot-tall, hairy biped strode into his field of view. It ignored him and silently passed back into the trees. According to Bro, Hubert was visibly distressed when retelling his sighting. His breathing elevated, his jaw clenched. In the autumn of that same year, two young boys so close they considered each other family, were hunting in the Honey Island Swamp. As they neared the river that misty morning, they heard a massive splash. Moments later, they saw the hairy back of a dark, muscular creature emerging from the water, rising until it stood six or seven feet tall. It effortlessly dislodged a cypress stump and tossed it into the river. Fear paralyzed both boys as the beast turned to look at them. Its face was hairless around the nose and mouth. Without making a sound, the creature took off at a brisk pace following the river's edge. When they mustered the courage to investigate the area, the boys found, in a departure from Harlan Ford's cast, a set of classic human-shaped Bigfoot tracks. The Pearl River forms the boundary between Louisiana and Mississippi. While most sightings of the Honey Island Swamp Monster come from the western side, encounters east of the river have occurred as well. In fall of 1997, a girl and her mother, Pikeyune, Pearl River County, decided to take their pet Doberman for a walk through the Mississippi side of the swamp at an exit off Interstate 59. It was just before 1 p.m. in the afternoon. After around 10 minutes... The daughter realized that she had left something in the car. She briefly left the dog and her mother on the road through the swamp, and when she returned, her mother seemed transfixed. She was staring at something deeper in the woods, and she pointed out to her daughter, who could vaguely make out an indistinct grayish-black shape around 75 feet away. Judging from the way the sunlight was hitting it, it filtered through the canopy. It was not a tree trunk. The texture was entirely different, more like hair than anything else, really. It also seemed large, well over six feet tall, 
whatever it was, the figure was kind of swaying back and forth, shifting its weight from one foot to the other. Both women became uncomfortable after watching for a few minutes and agreed they should relocate right now. They returned to the car with their dog, drove at least a mile up the road, and resumed their walk. Any sense of safety vanished within moments. The sound of bipedal footsteps began approaching from within the swamp, drawing nearer with each step. The dog, while not frightened, clearly displayed an interest in whatever was approaching. Once again, they returned to the car, drove further up the road another mile and a half to two miles, and then loaded once again, this time near some nature trails and a firing range. Within two minutes, the sounds were with them yet again, and this time, they had picked up the pace. Whatever it was, it was now running towards them, thrashing through the trees on two feet. The dogs bolted for the car, smashing into the door. Its owners were close behind. They all piled into the vehicle, leaving for good. Now, about three hours later, they returned to the location of their initial sighting, hoping to see if they could determine what they had seen. Maybe they had been spooked by a rotten tree trunk. Yet, where the figure in the woods had once stood, there was nothing but open forest. Whatever it had been, it had moved in the meantime, perhaps following them as they relocated. Another Mississippi sighting occurred in an adjacent county further south along the Pearl River in 1975. As recounted by the witness over a dozen years later, he had spotted something which simply should not exist while growing up in Purlington. He was six years old at the time and had been sleeping soundly in his second story bedroom when the family dog became agitated, barking furiously. The witness and his siblings all hopped out of the bed to take a look outside. Now, adjacent to the rear of their home, they clearly saw a large shape rummaging through the family's garden. The moonlight provided ample illumination for the figure, which was only about 30 or so feet below. It was squatting down, eating vegetables so loudly that they could actually hear it gnawing away. The intruder looked up, noticed them, and resumed its feast. While the witness could not accurately describe its size, he knew it was shaped like a human being, but larger and obviously covered in dark, shaggy brown hair. When it had looked at them, its eyes seemed to emit a glow. According to the story, the grandfather eventually emerged from the rear of the house, firing his shotgun into the air, and the creature stood up on two legs, running across the backyard towards the Pearl River with astonishing speed. The next morning, the garden was filled with oversized bare human footprints and the remnants of the creature's late night snack. The Honey Island Swamp Monster has long confused cryptozoologists. Could it be Louisiana's Bigfoot variation? While descriptions of the creature suggest this possibility, the footprints cast by Harlan Ford run contrary to all scientific expectation. The toes are the biggest problem. We would not expect three prominent toes with a fourth smaller digit in a primate foot. Where's the fifth toe? The webbing between the toes is much more prominent than the vestigial webbing seen in most primates. What's more, the toes don't end in fingernails. They end in what appear to be reptilian claws or talons of sort. Granted, all these features could represent adaptations to the swamp's wetlands and waterways. At the same time, the appearance does leave ample room for skeptics to mount a compelling argument that the Honey Island Swamp Monster's footprints are actually misidentified alligator tracks. The bayous are swarming with gators, after all, and the slippery soil could easily elongate a set of their tracks to look more like those of a hominid. Alligator feet also leave impressions significantly smaller than your typical Bigfoot prints, a feature reflected in the small size of Harlan Ford's cast. But at the same time, Officials from the Louisiana Wildlife and Fish Commission, as well as zoologists from Louisiana State University, were unable to positively identify what made Harlan Ford's cast. Surely they would have been able to recognize smeared alligator tracks, right? Whether or not the footprints are genuine, 
they have nonetheless birthed one of the most persistent origin stories for the Honey Island Swamp Monster. Legend holds that a circus train traveling near the Pearl River derailed sometime in the early 20th century. While most of the exotic animals that escaped perished in the swamp, chimpanzees thrived in the area. Now here's where the tale gets even sillier. The chimps successfully mated with the native alligators, birthing half-reptile, half-ape monstrosities in the form of the Honey Island Swamp Monster. If you believe this is possible, then our education system is broken. This is not the way hybridization works, folks. Species can only interbreed with closely related species, like horses and donkeys or lions and tigers. A mammal-reptile hybrid is genetically impossible. But at the same time, the inspiration for this urban legend is clear, stemming from the Honey Island Swamp Monster's affinity for water. Whereas most primates tend to avoid swimming at all costs, Louisiana's Bigfoot often seems unbothered when faced rivers, lakes, and bayous, as the story of Ted Williams indicate. This love of water is actually quite common in Bigfoot reports. In 1951, Kathy Connolly of Coventry, England, claimed numerous interactions with beings from other planets. Among these experiences was a meeting aboard a craft with several black-eyed cat people who seemed interested in whether or not she was pregnant. In 1967, Geraldo Bacchiero claimed to spy a disc in the sky that caused his ambulance's electrical systems to fail. It came so close that he was able to see its pilot. The brightly lit interior revealed a humanoid with a cat's face. A similar being appeared in the room of Austin, Texas resident in autumn of 1973, just days after his dramatic 10-minute long UFO sighting. The witness had been reading books on spirituality when a bright light flash illuminated his entire room, leaving behind the head and shoulders of a tawny fur being. The entity seemed highly intelligent, and its face resembled that of a lion's, only with a flattened muzzle. After a few seconds, it kind of just snapped out of existence. Now, in February of 2002, a hiker in Quebec found himself losing consciousness in the wilderness. He eventually collapsed, and when he came to, he was back at home with two friendly female faces gazing into his eyes. Over subsequent visits, the hiker learned that these beings came from another solar system and were visiting Earth to study its life forms. They had happened upon him in the forest several days earlier, where they had presumably rescued him. According to the witness, the two women were black with cat-like faces, ears, and tails. These mysterious figures remained a staple in the witness's life, appearing in disguise at social events and even at his local supermarket. Supposedly, his wife even saw the beings herself before they eventually bid Earth goodbye one year later. Whether this was a hoax, a product of mental illness, or a genuine, if weird, experience is anyone's guess, some of the UFO reports involving cat people add an interesting wrinkle. The alien big cats, or ABCs, and cat people are not extraterrestrials themselves, but are rather being studied by the aliens. This seems to be the case in the encounters of Sarah, Kathy, and Jackie, three college students who saw UFOs over Toronto in the late summer of 1979. The nights of August 2nd through August 4th saw a diverse array of craft flying over the city culminating in an actual landing the final evening. From the craft came four beings a little more than shadows. Sarah, the primary witness, lost consciousness. She awoke in another space, presumably aboard the ship, from which she could see the ground below. She then blacked out again, waking up just a short distance from where the UFO had landed. After stumbling home, Sarah found her face sunburned and her pupils dilated. Eventually, she consented to hypnotic regression from which she allegedly retrieved memories of her time inside the craft. The entire interior was ephemeral, allowing Sarah to pass her hands through its surface. Accompanying her were seven of the shadowy, nearly two-dimensional figures who explained to her that they were studying a pair of research subjects, herself 
and a peculiar cat-like entity that she also saw on board. Sarah's memories concluded with visions of a red alien landscape and vague recollections of various medical procedures. Over the course of several sessions, Sarah also recalled meeting a man in black who threatened her just before he vanished into thin air. Sarah believed that several strange puncture marks on her pinky finger provided proof of the incident. In another example, from April 1990, a young North Carolina girl remembered ascending into the sky in a bright blue beam of light. Once inside the flying saucer, she supposedly met several small humanoids, your classic gray aliens, and what appeared to be several human-alien hybrids, complete with wispy white hair. The girl's captors performed an experiment upon her, but it was unlike your classic alien abduction procedures. They seemed more interested in her emotions than her physiology. The aliens introduced the girl to a jet black panther, as well as a smaller creature. The beings made the girl watch as the cat eviscerated its prey, bringing her so close to the attack that she was spattered. After this ordeal concluded, she was brought even closer to the panther, now housed in a cage. The girl was instructed to reach inside and pet the beast, and when she refused, the aliens reassured her that it had been sedated. Sure enough, she reached her fingers through the bars and petted the animal, which remained perfectly calm. She was then returned home. Now, there is little evidence to validate her story. Perhaps it should be treated as a religious experience rather than a literal occurrence. Either way, the story was enough to impress celebrated alien abduction researcher Bud Hopkins, who presented it at the annual MUFON Symposium that year. In 1960, dock workers from Ketchikan, Alaska, described the grace with which Sasquatch swim. One of the witnesses actually wrote researcher John Green. The letter read this. The witness glanced up to see a human-like figure standing in the water halfway between the shore and the boat, just standing and staring at him. It had arms like a man and a head. It was probably wet and looked grayish color all over the head and body. It had round eyes, not big, beady-like. When the boy unfroze, he screamed bloody murder and ran blindly over the tied-up boats, back up the ladder, and toward the shack, still yelling his head off. The men came running, some with lights, and about 30 of them saw this thing. They shone several lights on it as it dived under the water and swam away. They could see it under the water swimming like a frog, arms forward over its head, but not doing a crawl stroke. The legs kicked like a frog. Plenty of accounts feature Bigfoot swimming far from land. For instance, J. Robert Alley's book, Rain Coast Sasquatch, features numerous instances where Bigfoot have been reported by fishermen out at sea. In one example, from May 9, 1990, crewman Lindsay Babick saw a Bigfoot in the waves through his binoculars. It had long hair, enormous black eyes, and a flat face ruling out a sea lion. Babick was familiar with stories of Sasquatch and knew without a doubt that he was watching one as it slowly slipped beneath the waves, never to be seen again. The sighting happened a full mile offshore. And in 1955, Mrs. Darwin Johnson was swimming in Indiana when a large furry hand with claws grabbed her leg underwater, leaving scratches on her knee. In 1967, a fisherman working the Nooksack River in Washington cast his net only to find a Sasquatch tangled up inside. Now, closer to Louisiana, an unbelievable story from 1970 finds two fishermen watching a skunk ape from their boat in the Gulf of Mexico. The nearest land was Placida, Florida, 29 miles away. Maps of waterways and maps of Bigfoot sightings in the U.S. do overlap a great deal, as do maps of rainfall. Even cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman had noted the preponderance of sightings along the creek bottoms of rural America. Could there be something deeper behind this correspondence? Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner have pointed out how numerous myths and legends from Europe link wild men to bodies of water. Wild men and wild women often took up residence in lakes and ponds or even the ocean. 
One of the best known accounts comes from the Chronicon Anglicanum, a 13th century English text. It reads this Men fishing in the sea caught a wild man in their nets. He was naked and was like a man in all his members, covered with hair and with a long, shaggy beard. He eagerly ate whatever was brought to him, but if it was raw, he pressed it between his hands until all the juice was expelled. He would not talk, even when tortured and hung up by his feet. Brought into church, he showed no signs of reverence or belief. He sought his bed at sunset and always remained there until sunrise. He was allowed to go into the sea, strongly guarded with three lines of nets, but he dived under the nets and came up again and again. Eventually, he came back on his own free will, but later on, he escaped and was never seen again. These beliefs even extend to the New World. Some tribes assert that hairy cannibal giants reside in the palaces at the bottom of the sea. In fact, the wild men and wild women of these legends are often indistinguishable from what we would call mermaids today, if a bit hairier. This has led prominent cryptozoologists like Lauren Coleman to categorize the Honey Island Swamp Monster as a subclass of mer-being. Coleman suspects it is part of a more aggressive freshwater land-oriented subclass. For Coleman, other examples of this mer-being subspecies include Canada's own Thetis, Lake Monster, and the Lizard Man of Bishopville, South Carolina. Alligator ape hybrids, mer-squatches, any attempts to tackle the Honey Island Swamp Monster from a scientific perspective lands cryptozoologist in laughable territory. A more worthwhile exploration of the creature and its footprints might be found in folklore. It's worth noting that numerous legends around the world describe hairy apes with bird feet, which the Honey Island Swamp Monster tracks equally resemble. For example, some, not all, but some tribes in America's Northwest describe creatures comparable to Bigfoot whose feet resemble those of large birds, being the French term for werewolf. These beliefs melded with similar stories already told among the area's tribes. Tales of wolf walkers, half-human, half-animal creatures haunted the Chittimacha and Atakapa tribes. Although few Honey Island Swamp Monster witnesses give the best canine features, the broad strokes of a tall, hairy humanoid prowling the Pearl River are certainly consistent. Other mysteries cling to the swamp like an early morning fog. Indigenous mounds and burial sites, some uncatalogued, dot the drier portions of the region. Tales of buried treasure abound. By the 1920s, the swamp's ominous reputation made it the perfect spot to conduct illegal activity. Moonshiners once operated heavily out of the Honey Island Swamp area, and anyone who failed to heed their warnings about monsters, stories often fabricated by moonshiners to keep their stills a secret, might find themselves the victims of foul play. One newspaper account from 1926 named Moonshiner Will Seals as one such casualty. Seals' whiskey proved too popular and too profitable for his competitors, so they set his house ablaze, fatally shooting him when he tried to escape. The act was never prosecuted as the criminal simply faded into the refuge of the impenetrable bayou. Some monsters are human, it seems. The Honey Island Swamp Monster is just the latest in a long series of legends to arise in the swamps of Louisiana. But more importantly, what do you believe? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And also, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and smack that big ol' red subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in the very next video.